I think since I'm part of the organizing committee, it's hard to, to thank the organizing committee for having me here. So I guess instead it would be better to all thank Florence for setting the meeting because, I mean, she's been the one who's been doing really all the work from funding to organizing everything. So I don't know where she is. She's hiding somewhere, I guess. She's, okay. So I'll do that at the, at the end of my talk so, so she can hear me. So what I would like to do today is talk about metronomic chemotherapy, which is an alternative way to give chemotherapy, and we'll see it can be patient-friendly and, it, it, and it's clinically meaningful. And that's, that is going to be my, the first part of my talk. And in the second part of my talk, I, would like to, I thought it was the, a nice place to introduce something that I had in my mind that I call chaotic therapy. So I think it was interesting to propose it to mathematician and modelizer to think what they thought about the concepts. So um, I look forward to having your feedback on that. So first of all, something we do in, in, in medicine, I don't know if you do that in mathematician, but I do not have any conflict of interest that could impact on my talk today. So, to give you a global background, since you're all coming from different areas, you know that over the last decades, in the Time magazine, we are being told that we have at last found the cure for cancer, but obviously the story is repeating again and again and again, and still patients are dying, so we're not quite there yet. You know that cancer is a global killer, um, and the main issue is that the number of cancer cases is expected to rise drastically over the next 15 years. There are five, five main killers in cancer, which are lung cancer, stomach cancer, colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, and breast cancer. One thing that, we, that most people don't know about is that most of these cases actually occur in low- and middle-income countries, which account for 70% of the cases. So this is something we have to keep in mind, I think, because we are, we are actually doing research for those who are already mostly cured, and we left behind all those that do not, do not, do, do not even have access to treatment. But we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that at the very end of my talk. So there was a major breakthrough uh, uh, 15 years ago, so that was a fancy new, you can see, in the treatment of chronic myeloid leukemia. Ursula talked about it yesterday a bit, so you know everything about it, just she Googled, she Googled it. And so basically in that disease, uh, we knew there were the specific chromosomes called Philadelphia chromosome, that, and, and that because there was like two one pieces of chromosome 22 that would go on, on chromosome 9, and they would result in the production of a new kinase that is really capital for the, the, these leukemia cells to survive. And so the chemist designed a molecule that could inhibit this taurinid kinase, and when this drug was given to patient, as you can see, this is the evolution of survival according to time in, in this patient, and so different treatment area. So as you can see, we were doing like really not very great for that disease, and with the introduction of that targeted therapy, we were able to cure or to control the disease for this patient for, and for most of the patients. And the second thing that is very important, since this drug is very specific, it has very, very little uh, side effect as compared to to chemotherapy. So we thought we had it. The idea was just like we have a cancer, we identify a specific molecular abnormality, design the drug for that, give it to the patient, that's it, they're cured. But unfortunately, it has, been, it has proven not to be that true. And actually, it worked because that abnormality is so strong and so capital and so unique in that disease that if you can inhibit it, inhibit it, it works really nicely. But I think we have to keep in mind that this is a very simple disease and it's well treated and easy to treat with one single drug, basically given at the same dosage every day. So sometimes you can adjust the dose because it's too toxic or because we have found out that if you have to have a certain level of drug in your blood, to ensure a, a, a maximal activity. So if you have a lower level in your blood, then you have to raise up the, the doses a bit. But it's, it's still very simple. 
So what happens if you face real cancer that are really highly complex disease with lots of cytogenetic abnormalities? And, it's, and, and basically, even nowadays, with all these molecular analysis that we can perform and combine uh, uh, in terms of protein or, or DNA or RNA and everything, well, we still can't cure them, right? So how should we treat them? And just to give you another example, in, l in lung cancer, some of the patients that have another mutation that's called AL a mutation in, in ALK, and you have a drug that just targets these ALK mutations, and as you can see here, the patient who received crizotinib, that's the name of the drug, well, they relapse a little bit later, but in terms of survival, basically, they all die at the same time. So in that disease, you can delay a bit the moment the patient relapses, but that does not translate into an increased survival. And the major reason for that is that the disease is too complex, so there are clones within the tumor that are resistant to the disease, or you can have, like, and, and these clones tend to overgrow, and, and you have killed those sensitive ones. So at the end of the day, it just like, does not work. Another example, this is not curves, but just like run clinical cases to show you what, what can happen. So this patient has a metastatic melanoma, so all these little bumps that you see are metastasis from the melanoma. And this patient, so in melanoma, half of the patient have BRAF mutation. So we have molecules that call BRAF inhibitor that can just like work. And you see after six months of treatment, like all the metastasis have disappeared. So we have a drug that can really work. And before BRAF, we basically had nothing at all for this treatment. So it's a major improvement. But the thing is that quickly they relapse. So there are clones here again that have different mutation, and we were able to identify this secondary mutation that are responsible for the resistance to the treatment. And it starts growing again, and then eventually patients die. So here again, it works, but doesn't cure patients. And here again, because the disease is far more complex than just one single mutation, and if you inhibit the mutation, then, then, then you, you can cure the disease. So this is a global conceptual uh, a slide that I, that I got from the internet, uh, which tells you basically what progress we've made in terms of longer survival, uh, an increase of survival with different component of treatment that we can use, chemotherapy, target therapy, and now the human checkpoint therapy. And as you can see here, we now recognize that with target therapy only, we just like don't do that much. It's not that better as compared to chemotherapy. But it took like 15 years to, I mean, we knew, I mean, we could say it wouldn't work that well, but still, it took five years to have officially that slide out. And it's been, um, it's been used by all the you know, regulatory agencies to just like acknowledge the fact that it's, it's not enough. And so the big thing now is to target immune checkpoint inhibitors plus eventually uh, um, target therapy, and, and hopefully we'll do better. I think that's exactly, that's, that's the point with this slide. So you can read whatever you want. But, <laughs> right, because you can't measure what happened over time, the, the, the magnitude of the improvement and, and over time. But it's, I guess it's the concept that target therapy works a bit, but it delays, it, it only delays uh, 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 um, progression, but does not cure patient. And we have seen now in melanoma patient or in breast cancer patient or in Hodgkin lymphoma that this immune checkpoint inhibitor can seemingly, because we don't have enough follow-up yet, but we, it seems like we can really cure patient with refractory disease. And from melanoma here again, we can think, it seems that if you combine checkpoint inhibitors plus, like for instance, PD-1 inhibitor, uh, checkpoint inhibitor plus, BRAF, then you increase really survival, get better. But it has to be confirmed. But it's just like a tendency. But you're absolutely right, as usual. <laughs> so still, what we do is still use a lot of chemotherapy for our patients. And what is, it's interesting to look back and see how, according to what we understand in terms of cancer, we use chemotherapy. And we started from conceptualizing cancer as just an aggregate of cancer cells, to cancer cells but do not divide at the same time, to cancer cells within a microenvironment, vessels, immunity, to an heterogeneous with clones that are slightly different, that grow at different paces, that interact with each other. And so it makes the whole, the whole treatment more, more complex. And so basically, this way of understanding cancer make 
us use chemotherapy differently. So in the beginning, as we thought it was just like cancer cells, the, the in vitro data kind of told us the more drug they use, the better it's going to work. But that's the MTD, maximum tolerated dose chemotherapy. At some point in the patient, you have to stop because it's too toxic. And if you keep going up, then you kill other patients. And the thing is, you, can, you have to space the injection of chemotherapy because you have to let your body recover from toxicities. So that's the MTD model. Then Norton Simon came up with a new idea because they realized that the cells were not all dividing together. So, and as the tumor get bigger, you get less, less cells that are dividing. So if you want to have more impact on the, on the cancer, and that kind of cancer, it means you have to use fairly high doses, but have to just like inject them closer and closer. So the first concept was dose effects, and that was the introduction of dose intensity. You have to really try to compress the interval between the injections. And there were clinical trials that, that showed that it, it would work. Then you have the introduction of microenvironment and angiogenesis, and that was the birth of metronomic chemotherapy. We're going to talk about it in detail. And another concept that was interesting was the adaptive therapy, in which you take into account the interaction between the clones. You had talks about it yesterday afternoon, morning, morning. Uh, and then you got the brand new thing, which is fairly more complex, uh, in which you have like different cancer clones, microenvironments, and you introduce all these. Well, I guess you got too many information for you, just clinician, to decide what drug you should use or which combination of drug you should use, where you need the computer to just like integrate all this data. So if you want to look with slightly more details what happened with the two first uh, uh, way of giving chemotherapy, they all rely on high-dose chemotherapy. So you give high-dose and it's toxic. The main difference is that you shrink the interval. And as you can see in that here, I don't know. It sits on colorblind. I never can see this thing. Uh, somewhere here? Maybe on yeah, that's good as it does. So if you use the standard MTD, you see that every time you give chemotherapy, the burden, the tumor burden just like decreases. And if you give like shorter interval, then it, it, it works better. That's the model, and it, it, it turned out to be true. But still, you know, that's high dose chemotherapy, that's toxic. Then there was these two concepts, they're slightly related because they're, they're not aiming at destroying cancer cells at all cost, but they're trying to control the tumor. So that's uh, a metronomic and the adaptive therapy concept proposed by Gattenby. So this is basically what he managed to show. Um, the idea is to just control the tumor. And seemingly, you hit hard in the beginning, what we call bang, bang. And then you just like lower the doses progressively just to contain the tumor as it starts growing again. And the, the thing behind it is that you have these sensitive clones and the resistant clones. And the sensitive clones grow faster than the resistant one. So you have to still have within your tumor a certain amount of sensitive clones that can keep growing. And then every time you hit, you get rid of the, oops, my ears are too small. Um, and then, so you have your sensitive clone that start growing again, but since they're sensitive to chemotherapy, if you hit slowly, you can just like maintain the global volume of the tumor and, and then control the whole disease. So here, this is the control. Th these are mice that I've been treating. So you can see little, the shots of chemotherapy here. So in blue, you got the MTD. So basically, you control it in the beginning, and then just like the tumor escape to the treatment. And you got here the adaptive scheme. And you can see all the injections here. So they are calculated on the rate of growth of the tumor before, before you inject the, 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 the drug. And with this approach, uh, you can control the tumor for a long period of time. Well, different, different model. And so that, that's the idea with this cartoon. You just like control the disease and cut what comes out of the box whenever you need it. The second very important concept behind these two approaches is that when, you were, when we were using high-dose chemotherapy, we knew that even if you let some time for the patient to recover, at some point it's getting too toxic. And you have to stop treatment, otherwise you will, you will kill your patient. So you can like, keep on treating them forever. 
With this new approach, since the, the, we were using low doses of chemotherapy, then it's non-toxic or it has only very limited toxicity. So we can keep giving it, not forever, but for a long period of time. And the idea that came out of it is that maybe instead of trying to get rid of cancer at all costs but not being able to do it, maybe a more reasonable goal would be to control it but for a long period of time. And since we had treatment that were well tolerated, maybe it could be doable. And some of the key opinion leaders came up with the idea that maybe we should consider cancer as a chronic disease. Right? If you have diabetes or hypertension, there's no way you're going to be cured. You have to take your, own, your medication all lifelong to just live with it. So maybe there's something we could work on for, 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 for cancer. And it's also a concept that has been used for target therapy. So, no, same color. Should be the same color, but I'm colorblind, so it's different colors. Mm -hmm. right. um, so, as you can see here with Gleevec, we just like have one, only one way of giving it. Same dose every day. Well, if you think about chemotherapy with a very same molecule, you can give it differently in terms of doses, interval, time of administration. So don't ask me why we're just like trying to do the same thing for target therapies. It's just the way it is. And so let's go to metronomic chemotherapy. So metronomic chemotherapy is that bar here. Maybe that's why I changed the color. So we're going to have a look at this, this long bar that's called metronomic chemotherapy. So the initial description of metronomic chemotherapy as metronomic chemotherapy was published at the same time by the two leading teams in the field of angiogenesis and cancer. The team from Judah Falkman in Boston and the team from Bob Kerbal in Toronto. And together with these two papers, there was an editorial in the GCI that really coined the term metronomic to this uh, um, pharmacological approach. So if we look at what this very first paper was saying, what they did is they had like mice with lung cancer carcinoma. So in that, very, in that very specific graph, they grafted lung cancer cells that were resistant to cyclophosphamide, which is the drug that is being here. So if you put cyclophosphamide in, uh, in the cell lines, they're just like nothing happened. They're totally resistant to it. So if you oops, don't do anything, see the tumor grow quite fast. If you use the MTD schedule, you barely control them for, several, for, for, for some days, and then they start growing very fast. And if you use the low-dose anti-angiogenic schedule here, you can control the resistant tumor to the very same drug for a long period of time. The other interesting thing if, is that if you combine it with an anti-angiogenic agent, you can overcome resistance and control the tumor for as long as the, uh, as the, as the mice live. So, and this was true not only for cyclophosphamide or not only for, for lung cancer, but this was true for cyclophosphamide, far very few in prenatal, and that was, good. that was true for sensitive and resistant cell line, and this was true for lung cancer, leukemia, and breast cancer. And the other very important finding is that it would actually work not because you can kill cancer cells with your chemotherapy, but because you kill the endothelial cells. Right? So you have an effect on the vessels, and then in turn, an effect on the cancer cell lines, on the cancer cells. And if you measure, the cell, that's the first thing. So you change the target. You just try, you don't, don't try to kill the cancer cell that you don't know how to get rid of by directly killing them, but instead you target the microenvironment. And if you measure the rate of apoptosis on these intelligent cells and then cancer cells with a two different approach, if you use a standard chemotherapy, MTD, then you see that you get induction of apoptosis on both on the telial cell and the tumor cell, but that will last for like a week, and then it goes back to normal. So that's the period of time when you have, that you have to have to let your mice here recover, but during that time, the tumor can start growing again. And eventually, the, tumor, the, the cancer cell, they just like managed to survive the cancer, so these are the resistant folks. And, and here, with the sustain low dose administration, you got to sustain induction of apoptosis both in the endothelial cells and tumor cells. So there's no rest for the tumor. And during 20, 21 days in a row, you can have this anti-cancer effect. And since you resume the new cycle after 21 days, you get a non-stop anti-cancer effect on your resistant cells here. And actually, the funny thing is that we've been using it without knowing that we were doing, it was called metronomic for decades. 
This is a paper from 1963. So that was almost the beginning of chemotherapy and the beginning of treatment and leukemia. And this is a randomized trial. Patient would receive the injection, and then for those who are in bone marrow remission, so if you put, get some you know, bone marrow sample, analyze it, they cannot see any um, cancer cell left. And then they're randomized to receive either placebo or low-dose prurenatal. It's low-dose, it's just far below the, the MTD. And what happened here, so it's not a major success, but it's back to the 60s, right? And, and sometimes it's not, we're not doing any better in terms of success anyhow. <clears throat> so, and as you can see here, the, the, the one who were receiving the, the prenatal was surviving longer, and the difference was statistically significant. So retrospectively, this is the very first proof that metronomic chemotherapy can increase survival of patients with leukemia, actually children. And we recently, because every time we're writing papers with Eddie over there, in reviewer we're making nasty comments about, well, you're saying that maintenance is metronomic chemotherapy, this is misleading, this is not true. So we decided to measure, have a little study to measure angiogenic, anti or pro angiogenic markers in the blood of patient children who are receiving maintenance treatment. And what we were able to show is that in this patient, during maintenance, so the maintenance lasts for 18 months, right? It's, pretty, it's fairly long. And so, so we measure all these elements every six months. And so there was a decrease in the endothelial microparticles that was statistically significant. So this is a marker of the activation of the endothelium. So it means you somehow put the endothelium to rest. This was associated with a decrease in endothelial progenitor cells. So these are cells that are in the bone marrow, that leave the bone marrow to just form new vessels or fix uh, damaged vessels. As you can see here, they just like go to zero, basically, uh, under the maintenance treatment. And this was associated with uh, an increase in thrombin spawning one. And thrombin spawning one is an inhibitor of a neurogenesis that is known to be a mediator of the activity of metronomic chemotherapy. So since you increase the inhibitor, you have an anti-angiogenic effect. So it's not only pharmacologically uh, uh, a metronomic, but it's also biologically uh, a, a metronomic treatment. So that led to the definition of what we call between us metronomic 1.0, which is metronomic is an anti-angiogenic uh, uh, treatment and is defined as the frequent administration of low dose of chemotherapy without long breaks. That definition was given by uh, uh, Bob Kerbal and, and, and Barton Kamen. The very important thing behind it is that you totally change the paradigm. It's not like hit as strong as you can, even if it's spaced out or slightly denser treatment, but you just like change the target. You want to aim at the endothelial, and you need to give only low doses, but like constantly. The main problems with this definition is that we don't really know what is a small dose. Is it like 10% of the MTD, 50% of the MTD? No one really knows. So some propose that it should be a dose that does, that does not impact on the bone marrow, so we don't have as a feedback all these progenitor cells coming out from the bone marrow to just go in a tumor, but no one knows. Then we don't really know what is a repeated administration. Does it have to be given once a day, twice a day, for 15 days, three weeks? No one knows. And then what is a long period of time? Same thing. Treat them for I mean, no breaks, but should we treat them for two months, three months, six months, a year? So there are lots of parameters in the definition that are too vague, that are not contributing to the field. So the way we work in, in the lab with Dominique and Joseph and I mean, you know all, all, all these people is try to put math in it to just like to go to the solution without ruining ourselves in having postdoc who just like heal the mice and treat the mice night and days and just like try to validate one hypothesis that has been proposed by the model. So what actually Joseph and Dominic did um, is that we decided to go for a, a model of metronomic MTD chemotherapy and then just like, and so that it would, it would help us to just like pick up the right dose and to show that this is achievable uh, with the computer. 
So what we've been doing is that we decided to work on a pediatric model, because I'm a pedi pediatrician, so we, we took uh, a neuroblastoma. And Joseph uh, used to work a lot, and has a lot of background on gemcitabine. So we decided to use gemcitabine, on, a metronomic gemcitabine on neuroblastoma. So we just like search for the internet to get all the data that we could put in the model, and then eventually generate some data to, 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 to have like stuff that was missing. And then we let the model work, and so the model told us this is what you should be giving. Metronomic should be 0.5 milligram per kilo per day. The control, of course, would be zero. The standard dose is 100 milligram per kilogram every two weeks. And the standard metronomic dose that you can find in other diseases with metronomic gemtabine ranges from three to one milligram per meter square. So we actually, we, we were not faithful enough in the model and we decided to have this kind of backup arm with slightly increased doses of metronomic gemcitabine to feel more, more, more secure and not do the whole thing for nothing. Yes, every day. I don't know if it's optimal, but that was the dose that was proposed by the model, so hopefully it's optimal. You know, I'm not the mathematician here, I have to ask Dominique and all, all the smart guys. I'm just doing the communication here. Um, so this is the mice, they've been grafted with a neuroblastoma. Uh, we also did some you know, biological experiments to study inflammation and geogenesis to confirm it was working the way we expected. So we were using a cell line that is uh, luciferase positive, so you can just monitor very easily the burden of the tumor within the animal without killing them, and also did some PK. So to make a long story short, this is the survival of the mice. So you got the control here. The treated MTD, so basically MTD treatment does not do anything at all, which was a surprise for Joseph, but not for us. And these are the two metronomic arms. So it seemed the model was right, because you do just exactly the same with the meat 0.5 versus 1 milligram per, per kilo. The, the metronomic, once a day? There was actually, in that model, where we had a little pump, uh, that we just like put surgically in the animals, so they just like f you fill the pump and just like let them go, and they treat themselves. <laughs> oh, so basically it means that how computer can help us to rationalize the the, the way we, we 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 use metronomic chemotherapy specifically here uh, on the dose. Uh, the next thing, this metronomic 2.0, and so uh, we published that with Eddie four or five years ago now, that we proposed that metronomic was actually not only anti-angiogenic, but if you use a simple anti-cancer agent, off-patent, cheap, non-toxic, you could actually have multiple targeted that are really relevant, if it's especially nowadays. And the big thing, the main difference uh, as compared to the angiogenic model is that metronomic can also have uh, an impact on the immune system. So there were no NTPD one at the time, right? So, so basically this is how it works. When you use metronomic chemotherapy, some of the cell, cancer cell will be killed. So you have like tumoral antigen that will be released within the tumor within the blood. So that will help the immune system to recognize the, the, the cancer. And you will also have an impact on three very important players in the immune system. So that will depend on the drug that you use and the dose of the drug that you use. And this is true only for low doses of these anti-cancer agents, so really metronomic. So you can deplete T-Rex using cyclophosphamide or temozolomide, for instance, and T-Rex and lymphocytes that inhibit the immune system. So if you get specifically rid of the T-Rex, you restore the activity, the anti-tumoral activity of the immune system. The second player are called myeloid derived suppressor cells. So same thing, these are cells from the immune system that prevent the immune system to just like go crazy. So it just like put him on health. So if you kill these cells, it works better. And the last component are called dendritic cells. And these cells are the ones who can recognize the antigen. So if you can activate them, you help the immune system to recognize the tumor. And so you can eventually design a metronomic treatment that would deplete T-Rex and malaria suppressor cells, because these are not the same agent, and dendritic cells. And you just like have a combo that is good for the immune system. And it works because since you use low doses, you don't have all this toxicity on the hematological, uh, on the bone marrow, and then you still have an immune system that can work. Well, if you combine it with MTD, then you destroy all, your, all, all the lymphocytes, so nothing much happens anyhow. 
So this very nice paper that was published by a French team from Paris in, in cancer research. And, and it just uh, illustrates really well what you can achieve with metronomic chemotherapy on the immune system. So they have animals, they tested different drugs, checked for the different you know, immune cells uh, that, that they had. And what they were able to show here, for instance, in Tregs, if you use cyclophosphamide, you deplete the Tregs in the spleen and also in the tumor. And it seems to be specific to some extent. Scrofave, if you, for instance, won't do that kind of job. If you check for these mildly derived suppressor cells, so gemcitabin low dose and 5 few low dose can deplete these cells in the spleen and in the tumor. And if you see what happens in mice, then you see that if you use this low dose 5 few, you got an anti-tumoral effect. That you don't have with doxorubicin that has a slight anti-cancer effect, and that, but that you don't have in the control. And in terms of tumor volume or, or mice survival, they use single agent low dose and combination of low dose chemotherapy. And the interesting thing here is that if you combine cyclophosphamide and 5 few, so if you deplete Tregs and malodiaf suppressor cell, then you have a stronger effect on the tumor volume, but also on survival. And to confirm that this uh, that works through the immune system, if you do the same experiments in nude mice, nothing happened at all. So it means it's really related to the immune system. Another experiment to confirm, for instance, that 5 you work through the, through the destruction of, of a myelin derived suppressor cell, is that if you reinfuse this kind of cells to the mice, well, you lose the effect of the 5 few. So that's very nice. But remember, the, the people who were doing angiogenesis were working in nude mice, and still it was working really well. So it seems that if a team works on angiogenesis, they use low dose, it's an anti-angiogenic approach. And if a team works on the immune system, well, it works through the immune system. But it was kind of puzzling, and we don't know what was the, the trick here. And we had some clue, thanks to the work of um, Waxman in, in Boston, in, in, in Harvard. And well, he has a strange model, but still, uh, um, it's, 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 it's an interesting clue. And what he showed, he went back to the initial publication from, 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 Robert, from Bob Kerbel, and he, he noticed that the way that we're giving metronomic was not like really daily low doses, but slightly more higher doses, and they had little breaks. So he tried, he tried the experiments and confirmed that in, in his model, the slightly spaced out metronomic higher doses was working better than the real metronomic. While you have like clearly lower peak of, of anti-cancer agent, but still the same uh, area under the curve. So it means the global exposure of the tumor to, 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 to the drug. So it means that and it was associated with, an increase, with a de decrease or increase of, of, of the, the uh, cells from the immune system that, that, were, that was interesting. So it means that just for metronomic, if you want to have both the antiangiogenic effect and the immune effect, you have to give it slightly differently. Increase a bit the doses and space them out a bit. So if you want to have both effects at the same time, I, I really know how to do it. And if you take into account then the way these drugs work, it's not a, like a linear curve, it's a U-shaped curve. So depending on where you are on a U-shaped curve, sometimes you have to increase the dose to have a, a, a better effect or decrease the dose to have a better effect. So, and the two curves are U-curves. So for one single agent, if you want to be able to have the best metronomic effect, Clearly, I mean, it's beyond my mind. As, uh, my, I can't do that as a clinician. So I guess we need you guys, and especially mathematicians, to help us find ways to solve this easy, oh, that, that, that may be kind of easy problem. But I, I'm going to make it more complex in a minute. So the interesting thing behind metronomic chemotherapy is like when you see the very same thing, it can have total, total opposite meaning. And when you look at a treatment, the way you understand it makes you understand it, how it works, and if you want to make it better, well, it, it, it will change the way you're going to use it, right? If you think it's anti-angenic, or if it's the immune system, or if it's a real anti-cancer cell treatment, then you're going to use it differently. So if I, if I show to a clinician that kind of treatment, temozolomide every day, he's going to tell you, well, this is temozolomide. I will say, well, this is a metronomic temozolomide, 
So I will think, well, this is maybe anti-angiogenic, or this is maybe it has some immune activity. So I think this is very important. So go back, let's go back to our metronomic model and see how we, you could help us. So that's one drug. Now, how about you have two drugs? And they have like some effect that are specific and some effect that they, don't, that, that they share. So when you had a second drug, it may have both effects on different components, different targets. So here again, I don't know how to do that to get the best activity with a two-drug metronomic regimen. And we can make it as complex as we want, because usually in metronomic regimen we have four or five drugs that can be given together or with the same combination, or rotate the agent to just like test all the combination together within the same protocol, and introduce break, and you also have to take into account the toxicity that can impact on the activity of the treatment. If you, too, if you have a toxicity on the, uh, on the bone marrow, then you will lose your immune system, or you have feedback uh, with your you know, progenitor cell from the bone marrow that would just like send all these cells to fix the, the vessels. So, so we do it the way we can. And so here we have the model, Metronomy 2.0, which is a multi-targeted therapy, acts on the vessels, on the immune system, on cancer cells eventually, because remember, when you, you, don't, you may know that, but when we were tested initially, we, when they were tested, the way chemotherapy should be given, we were some kind, some, somehow, there were parameters that we could work on, like concentration, very easy to work on. You just like increase the dose, put more drug on the cells. But since you're making, you're making these cells grow in, in, in boxes, at some point there's not enough room, so you can't let the treatment go forever. So it's much easier to make the treatment, with, uh, to, to use the treatment with higher doses than the longer treatment. And so that's part of the reason why we went for the higher doses and not the lower doses. And, if, and, and the people who studied what happened if you ex, uh, extend the, 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 the exposure over time? And you see that you can have a really anti-cancer effect and kill the cells, even with low doses. So I guess this also contributes to the activity of metronomic, although it's not fully demonstrated in a modern way. So, although we are doing very empiric uh, uh, metronomic protocol, we've been able to, to achieve some success. So these are two examples of treatment that are not called metronomic, although they rely on low doses. So when people published these results, I guess they were not aware that maybe it works because it works differently and is not that surprising. So this is an example in patient, first line of treatment with advanced breast cancer, and they compare the one of the standard of care, which is an IDOS uh, chemo MTD chemotherapy to metronomic, with cap uh, capistibin uh, that is given metronomically. Capistibin is just like Fevifu, but instead of being IV, it's oral. And as you can see here, survival is better, and the toxicity is much lower. So it's very nice for the patient to be at home, take your pill instead of going to the hospital and having more toxicity. And it works at least as, as well. And this is also no, another standard of care in patients with high grade glioma, and they receive, after, after surgery, radiotherapy plus low doses of temozolomide every day. I say low doses because usually temozolomide is given five days every four weeks at 150 milligrams per meter square up to 200. And we give here 75 milligrams per day, so really lower doses, and we give it for 40 do, 42 days in a row. So this is metronomic chemotherapy and an increased survival of the patient with agroglioma. And that this is another very, very recent paper that was published in The Lancet, which is for us a major journal in which usually important papers are published in. And these are patients with co uh, metastatic colorectal cancer, and they received or not a maintenance, here again, with uh, capacitabine and bevacizumab, which is an anti angiogenic agent. And as you can see here, there is an increase in overall survival and even free, and even free survival, oops, here and here in the patient, although the increase in, 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 in overall survival was just like almost not statistically significant. So still, it means that a metronomic treatment can increase survival in patients with uh, uh, metastatic uh, colon cancer. So we've been designing our own treatment, but at the time we were not working uh, that close with mathematicians, so the way we designed it is more it is grounded on some kind of mechanistic properties and not on mathematical optimization of the doses and, and, and schedule of the agent. So basically what we wanted, so that was for 
pediatric patient with refractory disease. We wanted a protocol with multi-drug. We wanted it to be non-toxic and especially avoid potential long-term toxicities. And these two drugs, temozolomide and toposide, were just like put away because they can induce secondary leukemia in the long term. We want it to be as oral as possible so the kids wouldn't have to be in the hospital frequently. And we wanted, to have, we wanted it to have both pro-immune and anti-angiogenic properties. <coughs> so this is the, 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 the protocol we came up with. Injection of vimblastin every week that is supposed to be anti-cancer properties, anti-angiogenic and dendritic cell activator. We had COX inhibitor so this is not an anti-cancer drug per se, this is an anti-inflammatory drug, but it has anti-inflammatory properties and anti-engineering properties. And then alternate three weeks of cyclophosphamide <coughs> and three weeks of metotrexate. And then have a little break for the kids to rest a bit. And this is the pilot study that we did with Institut Curie uh, in Grenoble. So we treated this 16 patient, most of them had progressive disease, the other were very high risk disease that were very likely to relapse quickly. And so the treatment was given as a maintenance. Oops. Some of them had pre so previously received from three, four, only one with only one line of, of previous treatment, but this was a very special treatment with a P53 mutation. This patient, most, some of them had received very high dose chemotherapy followed by uh, peripheral stem cell transplantation. Some of them had received radiotherapy, and some of them had already received metronomic chemotherapy. And what we were able to do, we compare the time during which the disease was controlled with the previous line of treatment versus this line of treatment, and usually what happens is that as you relapse, the con it's, it's getting more and more difficult to control the disease. And as you can see for this patient, we were able to do at least as well as the previous line of treatment with metronomic. And some of them received the treatment for more than four months, six months. So it means that it's really doable, tribal, and, and that, it ha that it has some activity. So if you want to take into, uh, if you wanted to design a metronomic protocol the best way you can, there are some parameters that you have to take into account. <coughs> So I listed some of them that I think are, are very important. The first thing is, which agent should we be using? Since you're targeting the vessels, can you use any drug that targets the vessels? Or should we, be, should we be using the same drug that works in an MTD manner, but in a metronomic manner? No one knows. Can we use metronomic for every kind of tumor? It seems that, like, no, there are tumors for which metronomic seems to be working well, like breast cancer, ovarian cancer, disease that grow kind of slowly are, are, are best candidates. In children, rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma are, are, are good candidates. Then, which dose should we be using? We've been discussing about it. Which setting? Is it better to start with metronomic first line? Is it better to give it <coughs> as a maintenance? Is it better to give it for relapses, for palliative setting, since it's not toxic, it's, it's better to receive a non-toxic treatment when you know you're not gonna cure your patient. Then how we should just like mix them together, which schedule should we be using? And then should we have breaks or no breaks? How long, remember, during the breaks the tuber can start going again? And then what should we aim at? Should we aim at controlling the disease for a long period of time or trying to get response even if they are short-lived? So, I guess the patient could decide, right? But. And the thing, things are getting more complex. This is a very recent paper, not that much, well, a year old now, <laughs> by the team of Bob Kerbal. And basically in that paper, he investigated how treatment can impact on the primary tumor or on metastasis. And he classified the treatment that way, based on preclinical data. And, and metronomic seemingly was not good at primary, but was good at metastasis. So this is also things that we have to take into account. And maybe this is why it works so well as a maintenance, because maintenance is designed to get rid of the remaining cells that could be within your body. So here again, we need to compute. There's no way we can just like integrate all these parameters <coughs> situation without a computer, I think. So you'll have a talk 
today or tomorrow on a protocol that was metronomic, a metronomic protocol of, of vimblastin based on simulation and, and, and models that is currently being tested in a clinical trial. So I just like listed uh, some of, uh, of some examples of metronomic trial in children. And so as you can see here, most of them are phase one pilot phase two studies, which are studies where you try to see if the treatment is well tolerated and you look for signal of activity, see if you can incorporate it in, in, in standard treatment or compare it to standard treatment. And most of the time you really have interesting activity uh, with response rates or clinical benefit, which means the tumor has been stabilized for at least six months, which is clinically relevant. So. Hmm? Well, in children, we have, as I'm aware of, one, two, three randomized studies that are either ongoing or are, have been completed, and we are awaiting the results. And there are European trials, <coughs> for instance, in mandibular where people agreed to have the, the, uh, a metronomic maintenance. So, but I mean, it's going to take like another. Uh, a year before we can initiate the trial, and then five years to recruit, and then another at least three years before we have the final results. So we, can, we, we have time to talk about it. Right? So, uh, of course, this is, this is not seen that much in, in children yet, but metronomics, uh, since it's well tolerated, you can, you can mix it with whatever you want, right? immune checkpoint inhibitors, targeted therapy, while in adults where they <coughs> tried to combine MTD chemo with target therapy was most of the time a failure because it was, it was in the end of the day too toxic. So it's clearly there's a window of opportunity to combine metronomic chemotherapy with basically whatever we want. And one of the very interesting fancy thing at the moment is, uh, is immune checkpoint inhibitors. So, um, this is it for metronomic. It's and I hope I, I convinced you that it's an oral, so easy to take, non-toxic. It's also important, but it's cheap treatment. It has some meaningful clinical activity. It's a multi-target TID, that's for the um, treatment, uh, as it can impact on angiogenesis and the immune system and the stroma and eventually also uh, on cancer cells and cancer stem cells, which are another emerging possibility. Uh, the idea is really to combine the agent and not only to use one single agent. <coughs> you can combine it with drug repositioning. I didn't talk about it at all today since Eddie will give a talk tomorrow morning, so be there. And of course, semen therapy and targeted therapy. And there's so much parameters to take into account that I think we cannot do a nice work, constructive work, and not just be on sand without you guys and come up with computational metronomic, as we call it. So that's, that's going to be the next, the next part of my talk. Um, so obviously, I'm not a mathematician at all. <laughs> so I guess it's, it's something that I had on my mind for several months years. Um, uh, I, I had that kind of idea of a treatment that would constantly change. And so it wouldn't be easy for, for, the, for the cancer cells or the, or the tumor to cope with it. So I call it chaotic. And I'll, I'll try to see today if it's really chaotic or not. But I guess I'll, I'll wait for your feedback to tell me if it's chaotic or not. Although it's not really important as you see if it's chaotic or not. So this is a starting point. <coughs> Easy disease, easy treatment, it works well. Fortunately, this is very rare. Most of the time, complex disease, <laughs> don't know how to treat it. I can't do that again. <laughs> so, so the idea is how can we overcome the capacity of tumor to mutate and adapt to basically any situation, and especially our treatments. So we know that cancer, well, we know, it has been described by several papers that cancer can be regarded as a chaotic system. Um, so I listed some of the publications, but there are like, like dozens uh, of them. And one of the critical properties that have emerged from the research recently, it has a huge potential of evolution and adaptation. And we don't really know how to cope with that. So the idea, what, uh, what if you can come up with a treatment that is changing constantly? 
And, it, and, and so it means like, could we have a cow tick treatment and fight cows with cows and we could come up with some order and activity out of this. So remember, this is just basically what we can do with a single agent. And we can just like combine this approach. So you can come up just with one agent with treatment with different intensity, different schedule, different density, different dose effects, and that would target cancer cells, cancer stem cells, immune systems, trauma, well, any components of the cell with it, just this. So, what if you use different agents? It's getting slightly more complex, so a color, an, an agent, and then here again, if it's high, it's a big dose. If it's like it's a long period of time, and then if it's more or less space out, it's when you give the shot. So, the idea, can we treat a complex disease with a chaotic, complex treatment? So, I don't know if it's good or bad idea. So, my first reaction was like, as a physician, if you tell me you're going to use chaotic therapy, uh, it's kind of freaked me out, right? Because um, anti-cancer drugs are toxic. So, and for me, chaos, as a non-mathematician, is a mess. It's something out of control. It's disorganized. So clearly, if one of my students was coming today, say, I'm going to do chaotic therapy with your chemotherapy, and just like, no, I'm not going to do that. So, then went back to understand where it would come from. So cows is actually a Greek word, right? It comes from Greek mythology. And cows was what, what's the first thing? What, before nothing, it was like before even Gaia, the earth, or all this legend from the ancient Greek world were there. I know did Eros for Ursula purposely. And well, the thing is that the cows is, is like an endless abyss in which you can constantly fall in any direction, and it's reported to be some kind of dark. So you're like in the middle of nowhere, going nowhere for whatever, wh wh however long. Give you an idea. So still, as a physician, I was not really reassured. So I went into math. So I don't talk math. So first I read it in English in Google, but I wouldn't understand either, so I said, let's go and, and read it in French. And we, well, well it's, it was getting better, but still. So what I got is that it was the word chaotic was introduced by two mathematicians, and it was basically a way to solve problem that would otherwise would not be solvable with classical mathematics. And the key features would be that non-linearity, the system had to be dynamic, not necessarily complex. And the very big thing, and you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the system and the behavior of the system strongly depend on the initial condition. And if you change slightly the initial condition, the behavior will be totally different. So that's what is called, I mean, we all know about that, it's, it's called the butterfly effect. And usually, people understand the butterfly effect as a cascade, domino cascade effect. It's not like you do something, that will do something, do something, and then you turn the computer and the whole body collapses, right? The whole building collapses. It's just like a little change will make the, chiffre, the system different, behave, behave differently, and, 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 will be, uh, and will get, in the end, a very different outcome. And they are also, so the outcome is totally unpredictable. And also, with some other dirty words, and just like I couldn't figure out what they were really in terms of poor clinician, or what they could physically mean, like attractors, and you got also the strange attractors, and you got the sustained regularity and the feedback, so well, I, I, I would be willing to learn more about it. So what I do usually is I, I use analogy a lot, and when I think about <clears throat> chemotherapy, multidrug regimen, I, I think about music, you know, and, and, and the chart of music. So I, I checked on the internet again and said, what could it be like as a, a, a chaotic music, right? And this is the first drawing that I came up with. So here again, I'm like, no, no way I can do that kind of, of music in chemo to my patients. But when, when I, I, I just searched a little further and, and I find this. And I said, well, maybe this is closer to what I have on my mind. Maybe what we need is just like a complex chemotherapy regimen. But actually, that guy who makes like chaotic simulation of music translate the complex or the simple or the moderately complex melody or whatever we call it into the equivalent chaotic music. And when I look at this, I was really reassured. Because I said to myself, well, if the black dots 
a black unit is a dose of chemotherapy, and a white dot is no chemotherapy, and it's just like a single agent, one color. Well, I can do that easily. Right? I can reproduce that in the clinic. I just have to decide what is the maximum amount of drug that I can get, and I can, guess, I guess, use that in the clinic, of course, after validating it in preclinical animals and so on. But it's really doable. And then I said, well, let's go back to our multicolored, multidrug regimen. So here again, I came up with patterns that are chaotic. That's what they say. And here again, if I decide that a square is a unit of drug, that every color, two minutes, I'm done, is uh, um, uh, a, a, different, a different drug, then I can eventually come up with a metronomic, uh, metronomic a, a chemotherapy protocol that will follow a, a, a chaotic concept. So actually, this has been done. If you look at leukemia treatment, right? So we started in the 60s, we were really bad, and ended up in the, in, in, in the beginning of the century with really good results. And this is what the treatment looks like at the moment. So it's fairly complex, different modules. Patients are stratified according to the so-called risk of their disease. And this is, look, this is what it looks like, the different phases of the treatment. Different drugs, different schedule, different doses, different doses for the same agent. So you, you start with induction, then in, and then go to protocol 1B, then ADE, and then MAE. So here again, different schedule, different drug, different dose. It goes on, it goes on. So, and if you go back to this colors and drugs code, you see that you end up with something that looks pretty much like the thing that I have on my mind. And basically, if you just like look at that from, from an aircraft, you see that the, the concept of treatment of leukemia relies on five different phases of treatment that all combines dose effect, dose intensity, different agent, different way to give the agent, time of infusion, etc., etc. So you do have an ever-changing treatment with dose intensity variation, dose effect variation. And you never know what the treatment is going to be like, because there are small changes, just like in the chaotic therapy, because you don't really receive the treatment at the very same time. Your body will not absorb the drug the same way. And so, because of this difference, the impact on different components of the, cell, of the tumor will be different. And at the end of the day, it's totally unpredictable if it's going to work or not, and when it's going to work, and when it's not going to work. So I guess the idea would come up with a, to come up with, with a mathematician, I would be able to design a treatment that would be clinically doable, so not too toxic, changing, dynamic treatment, strong dependence of the initial condition, it's just like it's, it's part of the game. And so come up with combination of agent, different drugs and schedule that would target all the components of the cells. So to do that, so I don't know if it's a good idea, just like this round dice. But I need input from the mathematician to decide if it's chaotic or not, and just like give us the idea of how the model could work. Then use the modulator to input what we know about one, two, three drugs, and tell us, well, this is something that is chaotic that should be doable. Test it in the mice with the biologist, validate the model, study how it works, how it does not work, and then eventually someday test it in the patient. And I don't know, I don't want you, some of you guys that would be chaotic expert. I don't like to be a chaotic expert. And well, if it's not chaotic, it's no big deal. We can call it complex dynamic therapy, but I think, because I'm the communicator here, I guess chaotic sounds better, right? So I've just one, one three sli last slide. Um, with Eddie that, that is here and, 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 and um, a researcher that is in Barcelona, we all share a kind of vision that we are doing research for as many people as we can, and eventually for the people who don't have much already. So we think that our research must be associated with social innovation to make as many people uh, as possible uh, hopefully have some benefit from it. So in that respect, we launched the global, uh, Metronomic Global Health Initiative three, four years ago now, <clears throat> that aim at promoting metronomic chemotherapy for children living in low-income countries, since it's cheap, it's non-toxic, it's really an alternative to standard treatment for this patient. So we try to network, we have a website, you are most welcome to have a look. Uh, we organize meeting to just like develop more work, more projects. We have clinical trials going on, we have preclinical study going on, some publications, well they are pretty good publication. So we did the website, you all welcome to join in. The only thing we're not, I'm, I'm, I'm not, he is. I'm not a Facebook addict, so I just want like click friends. I want real friends that take at least 30 seconds to write a little biography and send me a picture, and then everybody just like contribute the way he wants, and then nothing to pay. 
And this is, for instance, like the metronomic trial that are, that are actually ongoing or should be starting soon in children living in poor country or poor area of, of some country that otherwise would have a little money. That's it. Thank you for your attention, and I'd like to thank all these collaborators here.